Hello, I'm Phoenix City Council Member Carlos Garcia with District 8. We will never replace in-person teaching, but during these trying times, our children still need to continue to learn. The City of Phoenix is proud to partner with both the Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts to bring you Phoenix TV Classroom Study Hall. Youth and education is a priority for Phoenix. That's why the city is bringing you the study hall to your home during this next hour right here on Phoenix TV. Learning should never stop, so get ready for class. Here's the study hall. Did you know that you are a very important human? There is no other human on earth that is exactly like you. Not the way you walk, talk, or comb your hair, which makes you so special just the way you are. Good morning. And welcome to today's Read Aloud. My name is Miss Rodriguez, and I'm actually a general music and band teacher down in the Roosevelt School District at Valley View Leadership Academy in South Phoenix. My school actually is a brand new building, and when you look out the windows, you can see the beautiful South Mountain Range. It is amazing. Um, I'm very thankful for this opportunity to do this Read Aloud with you this morning. It is a very special book titled, I Am Enough. I hope that you enjoy. Before we get started with our read aloud, I actually wanted to share a little bit about myself. On the top left, you'll see my oldest cat, Nike. And then beside him, you're gonna see my youngest cat, Little Gray. This year, I also got the opportunity to adopt a puppy, who you'll see right there on the bottom left with his orange fox. His name is Apollo which stands for the God of Music and Art. So fitting because I'm actually a music teacher. On the bottom right, you're gonna see that on my free time, I also play this awesome sport called roller derby. My roller derby name is actually Dora, like Dora the Explorer. I absolutely love playing roller derby with my league, the Arizona Derby Dames. I hope you enjoyed getting to know a little bit about myself. I would love it if you could tell me one thing about yourself. That's really cool. Let's go ahead and get started. The book that we are going to read today is written by black author Grace Byers. The title of the book is I Am Enough. I really enjoyed reading this book because it caused me to have a lot of feelings inside about who I am as a person. So that at the end of this book, hopefully all of us leave feeling as though, regardless of the color of our skin, where we come from, what we look like, who we are is what matters deep down inside. I Am Enough by Grace Byers. First, I take a look at the cover of my book, I Am Enough. The author's name is at the top, Grace Byers. Pictures by Ketura E. Bobo. And the picture is of a beautiful black little girl with her beautiful natural hair, curly, painted back with a purple headband. Let's get started. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. I Am Enough is an essential book for everyone. An inspiring lyrical ode to loving who you are, respecting others, and being kind to one another. From actor and activist Grace Byers and talented, talented newcomer Ketra A. Bobo. Grace Byers is an actor and activist 
who stars in Fox's hit series, Empire. As a multiracial young girl and a CODA, which stands for a child of deaf adults, Grace was bullied throughout her childhood. This book was born out of her desire to empower young girls against the effects of bullying. In her spare time, she volunteers with the nonprofit anti-bullying organization Saving Our Daughters. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and actor, Trey Byers. This is her first book. Ketra A. Bobo is an artist whose dedication to creating vibrant images that depict diversity has gained her attention worldwide. She graduated with a BFA from Columbus College of Art and Design and lives in Ohio with her family of entrepreneurs. Visit www.ketraariel.com. Like the sun, I'm here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. Like the trees, I'm here to grow. Like the mountains, here to stand. Like time, I'm here to be and be everything I can. Like the champ, I'm here to fight. Like the heart, I'm here to love. Like a ladder, here to climb. And like the air, to rise above. Like the wind, I'm here to push. Like a rope, I'm here to pull. Like the rain, I'm here to pour and drip and fall until I'm full. Like the moon, I'm here to dream. Like the student, here to learn. Like the water, here to swell. Like the fire, here to burn. Like the winner, I'm here to win. And if I don't, get up again. I know that I may sometimes cry, but even then, I'm here to try. I'm not meant to be like you. You're not meant to be like me. Sometimes we will get along and sometimes we will disagree. I know that we don't look the same. Our skin, our eyes, our hair, our frame. But that does not dictate our worth. We both have places here on earth. And in the end, we are right here to live a life of love, not fear. To help each other when it's tough, to say together, I am enough. I would love to hear from you. What did you enjoy about the book? That's awesome. Which picture was your favorite? For me, my favorite picture was this one. I can pay attention 
to what makes us all different, from the color of our skin to the way we wear our hair. Some of us wearing glasses, some of us liking to wear skirts, some of us liking to wear pants or shorts. We even have some of us that are in wheelchairs and can't walk. Regardless of all of that, we are all human beings. And so this picture is my favorite because it shows me that not all human beings look the same, but each and every one of us is still enough. The reason that I chose to buy this book was to support black authors in the United States. My friends, I know that you've been hearing about some of the things that have been going on. And I know that you've heard about some of the protests and some of the issues that we are faced as human beings right now. I do believe that the world could give a little more kindness. And so today I'd also like to teach you a small lesson on the seven habits of happy leaders. Because ultimately, until we all grow as leaders, there can be no change. When I'm a leader, that means that I am in charge of everything that I think, say, do, and feel. Let's get started with the seven habits. Habit number one, be proactive. You're in charge of yourself. I have a can-do attitude and always try my best at everything I do. I follow directions and do the right thing without being asked, even when nobody is looking. I choose my actions, attitudes, and moods and don't blame others for my wrongdoing. Habit number two, begin with the end in mind. Have a plan. I plan ahead and set goals for myself. I am prepared at all times. I think about how the choices I make now will affect my future. I think about the positive or negative consequences of my actions before I act. Habit number three, put first things first. Work first, then play. I do the things that I have to do before I get to do the things that I want to do. I stay focused on what I'm doing and try to minimize distractions if I get off task. I spend my time on the things that are the most important. Habit number four, think win-win. Everyone can win. I am a problem solver when an issue comes up with another person. I think about what other people want and not just what I want. I'm kind to others and try to think of ways to make everyone happy. Habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Listen before you talk. I listen to others without interrupting. I raise my hand when I want to speak and wait patiently to be called on. I don't blurt out. I try to understand other people's views and feelings, even if they are different from my own. Habit number six, synergize. Together is better. I get along well with other people and work well in groups. I value the strengths of others and allow myself to learn from them. I know that by working together as a team, we can get more done and come up with better solutions than we could alone. Habit number seven, sharpen the saw. Balance is best. I take care of my body by eating right, exercising, and getting enough sleep. I balance my time between school, community activities, family, and friends. I am always learning how to become a better person. When I spoke about Grace Byers, her biography, which means the story about herself, said that she was an activist. And so right now, I want to focus on habit number eight, which is find your voice. We are seeing a lot of people in our community finding their voice, speaking up for the Black Lives Matter movement. We are seeing a lot of people taking the streets and protesting. Protesting is a form of activism. Activism means when you believe that there have been injustices or inequalities, you stand for that and you are out in the community, either protesting, writing books, um, writing music, in, as a form of acti activism to help that situation. When I use habit number eight, find my voice, I want to make sure that I use all of the other habits that came before it. I want to make sure that I also seek first to understand and then to be understood. Because even though I may feel very passionately about something, if another person does not agree with me, then that could cause a lot of conflict. 
and we don't want to cause conflict we want to find solutions because that's what being a leader is i hope that you enjoyed today's lesson i'm very very glad that i was able to read the book i am enough by black author grace byers to you today this morning i'm also glad that i got to introduce to you the seven habits and the eighth habit which is finding your voice i hope that you are safe and healthy with your loved ones and i hope that you have a wonderful rest of your summer goodbye Super friends, Mrs. Fletcher here, second grade teacher in the Osborne School District at Solano Elementary School. And I'm so happy to be doing science with you today. That's right. I love doing science. I get to use my five senses and I get to use my powers of observation to try to figure out how things work. I can't wait to do that with you. And recently in the last couple weeks, we've been talking about the sun and its light and how it affects the way we see things. What are we gonna talk about today? We'll get to it. It's gonna be so fun, I love it. All right, super friends, before we really get started, let's go ahead and do our science cheer. Are you ready? Let's go. S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, science, science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, science, science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, science. Science, S C I E N C E, science, science, S C I E N C E, science. Woohoo! So fun. Thanks so much for doing that cheer with me. I love doing things that help me remember how to spell and make me think about science. Well, super friends, we saw in the last couple weeks how the sun's light can affect paper, right? Our solar print paper. We saw how the energy can transform it, even on our own regular construction paper. Wow, that really affected it. We also talked about how rainbows were made when the light reflects through the water droplets and the white light of the sun separates into all those beautiful colors. Wow, you know what? It made me think of a question. How and why is the sky blue? That's a great question, scientists. You know what? Let's figure that out. Here's why is the sky blue? Brought to our friends by National Geographic in the big book of why, right? First big book of why. Why is the sky blue? Well, the air has lots of different things in it, like dust and gases, like ozone and oxygen. And light from the sun hits these tiny bits and scatters. That means it moves all around. During the day when the sun is shining bright, the blue light waves scatter the best. And it makes us see the, sun, the sky as blue. Wow, that's so cool. Hey, what does this little circle say? Want to stay cool in the summer? Well, yes. Wear white so the sunlight bounces off of you. Oh, bounces off at us, off of us, like it reflects. Oh, kind of like a mirror, or the way that the light reflected through the water droplets and made a rainbow. So, okay, super friends, I know white is a light color. So if I wore white instead of my blue shirt, it would help me to stay cool. But is there an experiment to see which colors actually attract the heat? The thermal energy from the sun? Thermal energy is the heat energy from the sun. What if we did an experiment using red construction paper, yellow construction paper, and blue construction paper? Hmm, but how would that tell us about the thermal energy, the heat energy from the sun? Well, what if we used these pieces of paper and we tried to see which ice cube would melt on which one the fastest? That would show us that color kind of absorbs the thermal energy from the sun. That's a great idea. We would be able to see the thermal energy converted to melt the ice cubes on each one of these papers. I see this blue paper is kind of dark. It looks the darkest to me. So I predict that this blue paper is going to melt the 
ice cube the fastest. That's my hypothesis. That's when I predict what's going to happen based upon the information and data that I have. Now, we're going to make sure that we need to use our five senses, right? We need to use our powers of observation. We need to use our sense of sight. We need to look and observe with our eyes. We need to listen and observe with our ears. We need to smell and observe with our nose. That's actually the sign for flower. It'll help you to use your sense of smell. We need to observe with our sense of taste. Hmm. And we need to observe with our sense of touch. That's right. So we're gonna go check out our experiment and see what we find out. Which one is going to melt the ice cube the fastest using the thermal energy from the sun? What's your prediction? Let's use a sentence stem. I predict, I predict that the, which one do you predict is going to make the ice cube melt the fastest? Are you ready to go find out? Let's go to the experiment. All right, friends. The first thing you wanna do is get your supplies together. That includes your construction paper and your marker. Let's check out our colors. We have yellow, blue, and red. Now we're going to make sure that we fold them evenly. Let's start with yellow. Fold it in half. There we go. Nice and tidy, all the corners. And then fold it in half again. Now let's fold our blue construction paper. Fold it in half and fold it in half again. And then we're going to follow that with the red construction paper. Now, these folds are going to be cut. We want to make sure that we have construction paper for four trials. That's four experiment tests. Let's get our scissors. Yep, we have our marker ready to go. Let's get our scissors and we're going to cut our four pieces of paper. This makes sure that we have one sheet for each color for each of our trials. So we'll have a red piece of paper for the first trial, we'll have a blue piece of paper for the first trial, and we'll have a yellow piece of paper for the first trial. There's going to be four trials or four tests, so we need to have a paper for each, a paper color for each test, for each trial. Then we're going to label it. We're going to mark the first one, one, and then second, two, the third trial, three, and then four. And then we're gonna cut up the rest of our paper and then label them one, two, three, and four. Let's do that with our other sheets. Great, there's our blue and there's our yellow, all labeled one, two, three, and four. Now let's set up with our ice cubes. You can see I had to hold them down, the papers down with rocks because it's windy. Wow, you can see that yellow and red are starting to melt. You'll want to check in on them from time to time and make sure that your ice cubes are not shaded at any time during the day. I did our test around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Let's check in about every 5 minutes and 10 minutes. And then it takes about 15 minutes to 20 minutes. This is at 10 minutes. This is at 15 minutes. Ooh, looking pretty close. Red doesn't have as big of a wet spot as blue or yellow does. I wonder who's going to win. Whoa, look at that red. Let's write it down. Here's our trials. Here's the first trial. Trial is the word that we use for our tests and our experiments. And in the first trial, we're going to write down the second trial, the third trial, and the fourth trial. This is how we record our data, our information. In our first trial, red was the winner. Who was closest again? Oh yes, blue. So blue would be who I want to write down kind of just to let myself know who came in second. Here's our second trial. There's our ice cubes, see all the twos? Yep, you can see all the twos on each one of them. Ooh, blue seems to be going. Ooh, look at red and yellow. That was close. On to our third trial. There's our ice cubes. Ooh, red is already starting to go right away. Oh, and a little bit over here on yellow. That's pretty cool. I don't see anything happening with blue. Oh. I had predicted blue was going to win. This is about 10 minutes and they're all about even. Well, red looks a little smaller. I wonder who's going to win. Ooh, this is about 15 minutes in. And look at that, red is so much smaller. So is yellow. Blue's paper's really wet. That's saturated. 
Oh, look at that. There's Fred just fading away, fading away. Now, in between your trials, you're going to have to wait till your, um, I had to wait till my stones dried, which takes just a couple minutes. Now, oh, yep, red is all gone. So when you're waiting for your trials to finish, see, look so close, nothing left. Well, oh, blue's still there and yellow is just fading away. Well, it looks like yellow's going to come in second place in this trial. So it only takes a couple minutes to let them dry in between the trials, but that's something to keep in mind so it doesn't affect the results of your experiment. So in our second trial, we had red and then yellow, which was a super close race. In our third trial, we did have red again, followed by yellow again. And I wonder who's gonna come in for our fourth race. Do you think it'll be red? Ah, look at those ice cubes, all the same. Whoa, this is about 10 minutes in, look at that. Wow, Blue's paper is really wet. There seems to be drier areas around the red and yellow. That's what I'm observing. Whoa, I'm observing that red again is melting away super fast. Ooh, Blue is close again. Come on, Blue. Let's find out. Oh, it's so close. Wow, there's yellow. Not as close as the last two times. Man, Blue's paper is really saturated with water. It's really wet. I wonder why reds and yellows seems to be drying up around the edges, even though it's melting in the centers. Hmm, that's interesting questions. I should probably document that for future experiments. Let's look closer. See, yeah, the edges seem to be drying up, even though the ice cube's melting on the inside, but Blue isn't. It's staying wet. Oh, look. Red's almost gone, and the edges are drying up. Wow, that's so neat. I wonder if that has to do with the color or the paper. <sighs> Better make sure we record this data, and not way we can look at it later. All right, the fourth trial. Let's see, who was the clear winner? Red. But yellow wasn't close again this time. BL for blue. And in the second trial, it was almost a tie between red and yellow. That's what I'm marking there. There's our final results, friends. Red, 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 red. <laughs> oh my gosh, friends, I totally didn't expect it. The blue paper did not win at all. No, it was really close, but the red won the four trials or experimental tests all the time. Wow. Are you gonna try this experiment at your house? You gotta tell me, if this red win at your house too? Hey, did anyone else observe that while the ice cube was melting on the red paper, it seemed to be drying up on the paper at the same time? I totally noticed that as the red ice cube was melting, as the ice cube was melting on the red paper, the paper looked like it was drying up at the same time. But that was not true on the blue paper, was it? No, it totally looked like the blue paper stayed soaked. Wow, so many questions. I can't wait to do more experiments with colored paper. So friends, is there a way that we could store this thermal energy or the light energy? Yes, and yes. One of the examples of storing light energy from the sun is right behind me and our friends, the sunflowers. They use their leaves to store energy from the sun. Wow, and that helps the plants grow super tall. Do you know, want to know something else? The sunflowers can move. What? Yes, there's a fancy scientific term for that. Are you ready to see what it is? You are. Well, close your eyes and count to three. No peeking. And I'm gonna show you a super fancy term for moving and growing to face the sun. Ready? One, two, three, look. Heliotropism. Helio is the part of the word that means the sun. And tropism means that you're moving. So heliotropism is growing to face the sun. So heliotropic plants, such as sunflowers, move when they're going to face the sun. Now, even before they have a flower, they will aim all their leaves where the sun goes. Then the sun moves, it rises in the east, and it sets in the west. And the sunflowers will move to gain all that light in their leaves to help it grow big and strong. 
Now when sunflowers get older, they stop moving. That's not sad. They're just using all that energy instead to focus on making new seeds. So great. Sunflower seeds are great for snacks and for growing, well, shade for my sunflowers. We love that. Quick question, friends. Do you know where the sunniest place on earth is? Can I give you a hint? It's in Arizona. Not just all of Arizona, specifically in Yuma, Arizona. Yuma, Arizona is the sunniest place on earth. Who knew? So great. Is there another way to store energy from the sun? You bet. You can store the light energy from the sun in something called solar panels. This little box. In this little box right here, it charges a battery inside my solar light. Now I got this solar light from the dollar store and it looks like a sunflower. And watch this cool trick. When it's light, when it's light, the light doesn't come on. And if I cover the solar panel, it comes on. Cool, huh? It's storing the sun's energy to charge the battery. Solar panels and solar energy. So neat. Oh, friends, this is great. But I have one more thing for you. I have a super great book and it's called You Are Light. It talks about all the different energy that we've been talking about. The light energy to warm the earth, feed plants, make things grow. Let's check it out. You Are Light by Aaron Becker. This is the light that brings the dawn to warm the sky and hug the land. It sips the sea to make the rain, which waters wheat to grow the grain. That's right. It feeds the leaves that shade the earth, like our friend the sunflowers. It brings to life each blossom's birth. There's the flower bloom. It lights the moon to kiss the night. Remember how the sun reflect, reflects on the moon? This light is you, and you are light. Oh, look at it. You can see right through it. Isn't that so neat? You are light. You are a delight. That means you're awesome. Your teachers really think that you light up their classrooms, and you light up your friends and families, too. Thank you so much for having the light that is you. Did you know that you can actually get energy and vitamins from the sun? You can. That's science for another day. But don't worry, so much science, so little time. There's always more to know. All oh, super friends, do you wanna know some more things? Well, don't worry, there's some great books you can check out. You can either look at your library online and get a free library card or purchase them as well. Great book to check out is Hidden Figures. These are some wonderful women that helped us with computers. They're super great at math and they helped us with space travel. Awesome. Hidden Figures. I recommend this book. Mm, these women are super great. We are thankful to them. And you know what? You can also check out things to make experiments at home with Far Out Science Project about Earth, Sun, and Moon. Yeah, so many great things. Friends, there's always more to know. Thanks so much for sharing science with me today. Let's do our goodbye song and science cheer. Here we go. Adios, amigos. Adios, amigos. Adios, amigos. Es tiempo de decir adios. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. It's time to say goodbye. Let's cheer. Here we go. S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. Science. Science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. Science. 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 S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, science, science, last time, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, science, woohoo, so great, super friends, thanks so much for sharing this with me, remember, always use your five senses and look around the world, ask your questions, right, use your powers of inquiry to wonder, but remember, Observe and listen, because sometimes what you predict doesn't come true, right? Sometimes it's something you never thought of. That's okay. That's good. It makes you ask more questions and more experiments. We love that. 
So friends, this is Mrs. Fletcher from the Osborne School District at Solano Elementary, second grade, signing off saying, I will see you later. Bye friends. Good morning students. I'm Michael Roberts, superintendent of the Osborne School District in Central Phoenix. And I'm Quentin Boy, superintendent of the Roosevelt School District in South Phoenix. We're pleased to have this partnership with the City of Phoenix to take Phoenix students on a new learning adventure right here on Phoenix TV. Just because our school buildings are closed doesn't mean the learning stops. We have the best, most creative teachers from Roosevelt and Osborne School Districts on board to provide you with a great learning experience. Okay, students, that's the bell. So the Phoenix TV Study Hall resumes. Here's your next lesson. Hello, welcome to first and second grade science. My name is Ms. Soto. I am a second grade teacher at the Roosevelt School District. A fun fact about me is that I love to swim, and Arizona is the perfect place for that because our weather is always so warm. Now, we are back with another lesson today, and our lesson for today is STEM. Now, what is STEM? STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Science is one of my kids' favorite subjects because they love to experiment and they love to do fun things other than paper and pencil. So I feel like today is going to be the perfect place for that. Now, this is not going to be just a regular science experiment. This is going to be a STEM experiment. Now, while I was researching for an experiment for us to do, I found three experiments that I feel like you guys will really enjoy. The first one, we will be creating a cotton ball launcher. Ooh. The second one, we will be building with jelly beans. Funny, right? And the third one, we will be doing a catapult. Do you know what a catapult is? You will find out. Now, all these experiments will require materials. Some you can find at home, and some you will have to buy if you have to, but they're fairly cheap materials. Now, for this experiment, you will need the help of an adult, like mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, or an older sibling. I hope you enjoy this experiment as much as I did, so let's get to work. For our first experiment, we will make a cotton ball launcher. For the materials, you will need a cotton ball, a single hole puncher, scissors, two toilet paper tubes, duct tape, a pencil, and rubber bands. We will now begin our experiment. As you can see, I have my six materials laid out. I have my two toilet paper tubes, a single hole puncher, some scissors, duct tape, two rubber bands, a cotton ball, and a pencil. Now it is time to get started. Our first step is to cut our first toilet paper tube in half. You will get your scissors and you will cut it in half all the way down. As you can see, my toilet paper tube is now cut in half. Now I will roll it into a small diameter. Now, I will tape it so it is secured. I will get my scissors and I will cut two small pieces of duct tape to secure my diameter. As you can tell, I'm placing it and making sure that it's tight. I will get my second piece of duct tape and I will do the same thing. There you go. It is ready. Now, since we have taped it in place, it is now time to put my duct tape and scissors away. I won't long, no longer need those. I will get my single hole puncher and I will punch a hole on one of the ends of my toilet paper tube. Cardboard is hard. So as you can tell, I'm using my both hands and I did it. There is my first hole. I need a second hole on the opposite side. There you go.
I now have two holes on my toilet paper tube. Now, as you can tell, I have two holes on my toilet paper tube on one of the ends. I don't longer need my, my single hole puncher. I need my pencil and I'm going to poke a hole through both of the holes that I created. I will leave my pencil inside these two holes. I am just sliding it in and out to show you that it is placed correctly. Now, this is where the fun begins. We will now use our second toilet paper tube. Now, with our second toilet paper tube, I am going to need my scissors once again. I am going to cut two slits and they're just small openings and I'm going to do it on the side, as you can tell. They're just small. In a second, I will show you how small they are because I will press them down. They are small slits. They are not big. Now, I will put my scissors away. I don't longer need those. It is now time to use our rubber bands. With my rubber bands, I will place them in the slits that I created. One goes there, one goes on the opposite side. Perfect. I will now get more duct tape to secure the slits so my cotton ball launcher will be strong. I will place one on one side and one on the other. With this piece of tape, I will make two pieces. Remember that you also have to save material, so if you can save material, it is perfectly fine. I will place it down, and I will rub it together, make it even, and there it is. My rubber band is now secured. I will do the same to the other side. I will place it. I will rub it together. And there we go. It is now tightly secured as well. As you can tell, both of my rubber bands are now tightly secured. Now, now our second toilet paper tube will also come together with our first one. As you can tell, our pencil is still in there. We are going to put it in the middle. Hmm, now it's starting to look like a launcher. The rubber bands are going to go around the pencil, just like that. There you go. Just around the pencil. It is ready. Now the fun begins. Our cotton ball will go inside the launcher. We will place it. It is now ready to go. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's test it out. Whoa, did you see that? That was awesome. Let's watch that again in slow motion. Wow. I really hope you enjoyed the cotton ball launcher experiment we just created. That was a really fun experiment and now we are ready for a second one. Our second experiment is called building with jelly beans. The materials you will need, you only need two of them. You will need toothpicks and jelly beans. Let's get started. All right, let's get started. I have laid out my materials. You will need jelly beans. I got all kinds of jelly beans of different colors and toothpicks. Let's get started. I have gotten my toothpicks out of the box, so we are ready to go. My jelly beans are in the jar, as you can see. Now, I will take a jelly bean and I will put it on the corner of one of the toothpicks. My goal is to make a cube. I am going to be buildings. So, if I'm going to make a building, I have to make a strong base. So, I'm going to make it into a cube. As you can tell, I am putting one on each corner. Think of a cube or a square. That is our base. Jelly beans are kind of hard, so don't be afraid to uh, stab it in there, but also be very careful. 
Toothpicks can be kind of pokey, so you have to be very careful with your fingers. Hold it very tightly, just like I am. That didn't work, you can dry it on the other corner just like that. That is going to be my base. As you can tell, I have my base. There you go. Now, I will do it once again, and I'm going to stack it on top. I am building. The challenge of this experiment is to see how many jelly beans you can stack all together on top of each other. So we'll see how many I'm able to stack at the end. Hmm. So I decided to place all my toothpicks ready to go, so then it's going to be easier to place the jelly beans. Again, I'm using both of my hands, both of my hands all over again. I need toothpicks now. I'm going to put it yellow and I'm going to put it with the pink. As you can tell, my hands are moving quickly, but I'm being very careful still. Wow, that is starting to look like a 3D shape right there. It looks like a cube. It's awesome. Again, remember that when you're doing this, to be very careful and also to remain counting the jelly beans that you're placing in your building. There you go. Very colorful cube. I am all done now. As you can tell, this is my finished result of building with jelly beans. Are you ready to count the jelly beans with me? We are going to count the jelly beans to see how many we created. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Well, as you can tell, I use 16 jelly beans. I am glad that our buildings and our cities are not made out of jelly beans because jelly beans are not very strong, but it was very fun to build with them. I challenge you to beat me and try to add more jelly beans than I did. I only did 16, but I'm pretty sure you can do more. I hope you enjoyed building with jelly beans. We will now do our last experiment, which is our cotton ball catapult. The materials are one cotton ball, eight craft sticks, cap of a drink, a hot glue gun, and rubber bands, small ones. Let's get started. I have laid out my materials for us. You will need five materials for this experiment. I have small rubber bands. You will need a lot of them, so just get a bunch. A cotton ball. You will need a cap of a drink. I'm using the cap of a Gatorade bottle. You will need eight popsicle sticks or craft sticks and a hot glue gun. Remember, since you will be needing a hot glue gun, to use an adult or an older sibling to help you with this experiment. I hope you guys will enjoy this. Let's get started. Let's get started. Your first step is to get six popsicle sticks. You will need to put them in a line all together and we are actually going to secure them with a couple of rubber bands on each end. So. As you can tell, I will grab a rubber band and I will tie it around the popsicle sticks. Since there is a lot of them, try to only do two loops. If not, they will snap back in your fingers and that may hurt a little bit. I like to do a couple rubber bands on each corner so they are tight and secured. I will do the same thing to the other corner. There you go. Remember that there's a lot of popsicle sticks, so the more the rubber bands, the better. 
We want it to be strong. Now we will work with our two leftover popsicle sticks. Now, we will grab a couple rubber bands, but instead of doing it on both corners, we're only gonna tie them around one corner, and you will see why in a second. I will use four rubber bands to put them in the corner, and I will just make them really secured so our catapult will be strong. Again, you will not tie rubber bands on the other corner of the two popsicle sticks. Now that I have finished tying my rubber bands with my two popsicle sticks, I will carefully open them and I will stick them in the middle of my six popsicle sticks created. I'm going to secure them. Now that we have them secured, I am now going to use more rubber bands to secure them all together. Since they are secured now, I am now going to start using my rubber bands. The way that you will use your rubber bands, you will use your rubber band in an X formation. I will show you how that looks like. Now, after all those rubber bands, our catapult is slowly coming together. It is now very tight. Now we'll use our hot glue gun. We'll place some glue on the corner of our sticks. As you can tell, it is going on the top portion. This is the part where you ask an adult to help you since a hot glue gun is very dangerous if not handled carefully. You will press your cap on the corner so it is strongly secured. I am double checking that it is strongly secured and I'm gonna test it out without the cotton ball. It looks good. It is now time to test our catapult. We have worked really hard and we will now see our results. We'll place our cotton ball on the cap. I wanna use my two index fingers to hold down my catapult and I will use my thumbs to hold it back and release. Did you see that? We can watch it again in slow motion. Let's see that. Wow. That was awesome. I hope you enjoyed that, friends. Hello, we are back. I hope you enjoyed watching me do those experiments. I challenge you now to create those experiments at home. My favorite was the cotton ball launcher. I had a lot of fun creating it, and it was easy to find those materials at home. It's crazy how sometimes we have those materials laying around at home and now you can use them for something in your house. 
Now, my other challenge to you is to teach someone in your house this experiment. Maybe someone didn't watch this with you. Now it is your job to be the teacher and you do that. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Remember, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I'll see you next time. My name is Mrs. Macias. I am a fourth grade teacher at Sunland Elementary. Fun fact about me today is that I came to the United States when I was seven years old. I was born in a different country. The name of that country is Mexico or Mexico. Do you know that Mexico borders the United States? And you should know but I'm sharing this fact for a very obvious reason. It'll become more obvious as we move forward. The Sonoran Desert is shared between the country of Mexico and the United States. The reason why I'm sharing that is because today we are going to do a read aloud together called the Night Flower. Have you seen this flower before? Does it look similar to something you've seen? other than the night flower, it is also called the saguaro blossom, which is our state flower in the state of Arizona. The reason why it's our state flower is because it only grows here in Arizona and parts of Mexico. If it's called the saguaro blossom, where kind of plant do you think it grows on? Exactly, the saguaro. It grows on top of saguaros and we can infer or we can that the night flower, when do you think it blooms? Do you think it blooms in the daytime or at nighttime? You're right, it blooms at night. That's why it's called the night flower. Today we are going to talk about different types of plants that are able to adapt to our Sonoran Desert. So in the Sonoran Desert, the different plants are able to adapt to their environment, to the heat, to the cold of the night. Do you know what adaptations are? Adaptations are those things, those characteristics that plants or animals do in order to survive to their unique environments. Think about the plants that you have seen all around when you are walking your neighborhoods, when you are on the freeway with your pair, your family, or if you're ever taking a hike on the weekend, if you look at the different plants, they're very unique to us in Arizona. And when you travel to other parts, say California, they leave by the beach, the plants start to look different. Why do you think we have different plants? We definitely have different plants because they adapt to the environment. Plants that survive in California weather would probably not survive here in our Arizona weather. So while I'm reading this book, I want you to keep that in mind and pay attention to those unique characteristics of the saguaro blossom and the different plants that this book will show. And I also want to challenge you and think about the animals that will come up in the illustrations of the book, the pictures, and think to yourself, how do these animals also adapt to their environment? Because both plants and animals are can adapt to their environment. Here we go. The Night Flower by Laura Hawthorne. I like that this book starts with very fun facts about the saguaro blossom. I will share them with you. It says, the saguaro cactus is found in the Sonoran Desert, which stretches approximately 100, 400, 100,400 square miles from the southwestern United States to the northwestern part of Mexico. The saguaro's flowers are special because they bloom for a single night once a year. During this short period, their strong scent and brilliant white petals attract rare pollinators, including bats, moths, and doves. 
we are used to hearing about common pollinators like butterflies, hummingbirds, but the bats, the moths, and the doves are common to us here in Arizona because our environment is much, much different than other places. Look at these beautiful illustrations. Oh, how many saguaros do you see in the picture? Let's start reading. The desert is greeted by the climbing sun. It's vibrant and busy now that spring has begun. Can you spot the saguaro so spiky and tall? A, a haven for wildlife, the large and the small. Atop of the saguaros at great lofty heights, birds can sit safely and rest for their flights. Woodpeckers tap, making holes with their beaks, little round homes where they can retreat. The desert blooms pink, orange, yellow, and red while bees, birds, and butterflies dance overhead. Bright colored petals call out to small beasts, enticing the near them nearer for nectar field feasts. Hiding his shade beneath sweat smelling trees, wandering deer are enjoying the leaves. Young squirrels leap from thin branches that sway. They top and they hide, carefree as they play. Huh, I feel like I've seen these kinds of trees in my neighborhood. Have you? As temperature rise, the sun bakes the hard ground. Sleepy eyes close and there's barely a sound. Spotty scaled lizards look out at the view, waiting for nightfall when noise will ensue. Interesting. It's nighttime and it's so calm. Everybody's away with closed eyes. What do you think closed eyes means? Could be sleeping. Animals wait for the night flower show, but for now the whole desert is sleepy and slow. A tortoise plods by in the heat of the day while a rattlesnake rasps as it snoozes away. The desert wakes up as the temperature cools. Animals search for the precious first bloom. They head for a cactus, the tallest in sight waiting and watching as day turns to night. As the darkness sets in monster and delight, searching for flowers in the cool desert night, a fierce furry hunter with sharp pointed teeth howls at the sky on its little pink feet. And high in the cactus beneath the bright moon, a tiny green bud is beginning to bloom. Wow. Its white velvet petals unfurl and reach high and a thick fruity fragrance fills the night sky. As more flowers wake in a chorus of scent, new creatures appear for this special event. Brown bats with black wings send something sweet and gather to sip from the night blooming treat. Yum. Around the saguaro in the shining moonlight, the desert is festive and thriving tonight. Bobcats chase pack rats and ringtails climb high while the blooms rest like stars against the night sky. At the dawn of the day with the new rising sun, the bats hurry home to take care of their young. For the birds and the bees, there are still a few hours to visit the cactus and sip from its flowers. So the bats are off going to bed because the sun has come up and the birds and the bees are still staying around. I wonder why. <clears throat> 
The desert will quiet as the day starts anew, but the busy Zawaro has work yet to do. Its flowers will close and a red, a red fruit will grow with seeds that will make a new Zawaro. Right, guys, we're going to get started by getting a few materials that you may have around your house, like a pencil, a piece of paper, and of course, you always need your eyes, your senses to be able to be part of our investigations during the science activity. Uh, and then I wanted to touch base on the saguaro. Here is a diagram of a saguaro. Saguaros are so special to us here in Arizona and from my home country, Mexico, where we are able to see them. And when people come from other places, they're like, whoa, that's such a strange plant. And they immediately are attracted to them because they are so unique to, to our Sonoran desert. So um, saguaros are able to adapt and survive to the Sonoran desert climate because of very special structures that it has. We're gonna start from the bottom and work our way up. These special roots that they have they grow shallow. They don't go deep into the soil. They stay very close to the top of the soil so that when it rains and that it can collect water much quickly rather than waiting for it to go all the way down. So shallow roots allows it to collect water much faster than if it had really deep roots, like really big trees or things like that. Then we move on to its beautiful trunk. We can think of the saguaro like our very own kind of tree because it does have a very big trunk. They get very big, very thick. What's important to know about the trunk is that inside of this beautiful structure, inside it contains water. And the water is inside of this big trunk because you guessed it, it stores its water it makes sure that it has enough water through the very dry seasons of the desert. So if it's not raining, it is, has the water that it needs to survive inside its trunk. How cool is that? And then we move up and we have the spines. The spines are here because animals know, animals that live in the desert, of course they know that there's water in, stored inside of these cacti, that the spines why do you think they have the spines? They totally have the spines to protect themselves from the animals that are trying to drink its water. Awesome. And then, of course, we have its arms. Saguaros have, have different arms. They can have one, they can have two, they can have three, they can have five, they can have tons of arms. Um, and then as we move up to the crown of the saguaro, the crown, like the top of the head, would be where it grows its fruit, its blooms, and all of that good stuff. And every arm has its own crown and it starts to develop blooms or fruit. Uh, and then of course we have the red fruit that carries its seeds. When the seeds fall off, a new saguaro can begin its life cycle. All right guys, let's get started in sorting our different plants into the categories of either desert or other, keeping in mind the characteristics of a saguaro. And if these plants have similar characteristics, we can infer that maybe they grow in the desert or maybe they don't. We wanna keep in mind the structures of it, thinking of the saguaro, giving you that reminder one more time. So let's get started with the little guy that I brought. He. So he has, or this guy, this plant, has spikes, which is similar to the saguaro, yes. It, it is, has a similar color to a saguaro. It is long, uh, skinny and spiky and it's growing new blooms. That's why I'm wearing my gloves. We wanna make sure that we're safe. Do you guys think it goes into the saguaro if it has spikes? If it's green, doesn't have the leaves, kind of has a big trunk like the saguaro. Okay, I agree with you. Let's go ahead and I am going to tape him there. Let's see if he stays. All right. Our next one was, was what is nicknamed the Chinese money tree. 
And if we look at it, it has big leaves. Does the saguaro have big leaves? No, not really. So if it doesn't have big leaves, then we can assume that it is most likely not going to survive in, that if it has big leaves, it won't survive in the desert because remember leaves release the water, they absorb the sunlight. So if they have a bigger leaves, they're gonna absorb much more sunlight. And in the Sonoran Desert, there's not a lot of shade. What do you think? Other? Okay, let's go ahead and put this one on the other. Very cool. Our next one is one with leaves, stringy, uh, has many leaves, small and big. Does this look similar to the saguaro? No. Okay. So we're thinking other. Awesome. We have what I nicknamed my elephant ears. It is, has leaves. Saguaros don't necessarily have leaves. But if I look at this one closely, it has, it's kind of squishy and it has a similar structure to the thickness of the trunk of a saguaro. And because of that, I think that it could survive in the desert, could look like a shrub. If it has small leaves, is it collecting more sunlight or less? Probably less. So. Let's go ahead and put this one on the desert. Maybe not our Sonoran Desert. Great. And then we have up next this particular tree branch that's coming from a tree that is in my backyard, but it has very small leaves in comparison to something like the Chinese money tree that has very big leaves. Do you think this would grow in the desert or in other? What are you thinking? Small leaves, maybe desert? Let's see, we'll put them there for now. You know, you could continue this investigation by testing these plants, putting the other into the de in your backyard and seeing if they would grow. And then we have the very famous pancake plant or UFO plant, like I like to call it. Big leaf, very circular, big leaf, a track. Getting a lot of sunlight, absorbing a lot of sunlight with its leaf. Do we think it's going to grow in the desert or in other climates? You're thinking other? Perfect. Put her in other. I'll put her slanted so it fits. Great. And then we have this one, very flat, has spikes. Remember to be safe and wear gloves. I'm holding it from the bottom. And it's squishy, same coloring as the saguaro would have. Looks a little similar. If I take one of these from the elephant plant, the color is similar. Scientists use all of their senses. See how similar the coloring? Maybe that's an adaptation. Okay, we're thinking desert. And we're coming on to the Monstera. Do we think the Monstera would survive in our desert? It's a little sunburned if you look at the brown. If plants have brown, it means that it has a little bit of sunburn. So knowing how big this leaf is, does it look anything like a saguaro? No, not at all. It has a big skinny stem, a uh, big leaf, kind of broken Swiss cheese-like, has holes. You're thinking other. Okay, let's go ahead and put this beautiful plant in other. Covering up our saguaro, huh? All right, and then the next one is what I call our hairy man or our hairy old man hair. I have to be very careful with this one. If it's going to prick me and I have to wear gloves, similar when handling a saguaro, do you think it could 
survive in the desert? Why do you think it has the hair? Does it use it to protect itself some way, somehow? Maybe to keep animals away? And again, has that similar color. It could be, it's tough. Okay, we are thinking desert. Thank you for helping me sort through these plants. I wanted to share this investigation with you because remember, even though we're not at school right now, we can be scientists at home by asking our, us ourselves questions about the things that are around us. Like I did, I developed this activity by looking at my different plants and thinking, could these plants grow in our Sonoran Desert? Ask yourself those questions as you're walking in your neighborhood, do the plants that they have, could they grow out in the wild Sonoran Desert? Or are they protected by a shade that the house has? Is that why they're able to um, grow? Because they have controlled the conditions in which the plant is planted or potted? Or do you in your home have plants inside? Have you asked yourself, why are those plants inside? Have they adapted to survive inside? What kind of characteristics is your family giving the plants? What kind of environment are they giving the plants in order for them to survive? Thank you for learning with me. Thank you for investigating. Thank you for putting on your science hat. I encourage you to do this at home and ask yourself about the different plants that you see growing in your neighborhood or in your home. Thank you, boys and girls. I will see you another time. Have a great day summer hi there i'm mrs Nethero, and i'm a sixth grade teacher at sunland elementary in the roosevelt school district during our time together today we're going to take some steps and learn some new things that will help us to complete an engineering challenge at home so the first thing we're going to do today is we're going to talk about exactly what it means to be an engineer. Second, we're going to do a super short read aloud where we'll gain some inspiration for our engineering challenge. Then me and some guests will walk you through the engineering design process so you're set up for success to complete this challenge at home by yourself or maybe with some family members. Let's get started. Let's talk about what an engineer is. An engineer is someone who shares their curiosity, observes and wonders. Engineers explore the world around them. They discover new things. Engineers create, they invent, they ask questions, and they use tools to solve problems. Take a look at the definition of an engineer on the right-hand side of your screen. Let's read the definition of an engineer together. An engineer is someone who designs or creates something to solve a problem. You can be an engineer. Now that we have a better understanding of what engineers do and what engineers are, we're going to do a short read aloud. This read aloud is titled, After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again and it's written by an author named Dan Sontat. I chose this read aloud for two reasons. The first reason I chose this read aloud is because Humpty Dumpty, our main character, shows a really important character trait that I would argue all engineers need to have. So I want us to learn from Humpty Dumpty throughout this story today so we can take his character trait on in our own lives as we go through the engineering design process. We're going to learn from Humpty Dumpty as he identifies a problem in his own life and he starts designing and creating a solution to that problem. The second reason I chose this story is because I need Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. I need that familiar nursery rhyme fresh in our mind because Humpty Dumpty is going to be the inspiration for our engineering design challenge today. After the Fall, How Humpty Dumpty Got Back Up Again, a story by Dan Santat. My name is Humpty Dumpty. This was my favorite spot, high up on the wall. I know it's an odd place for an egg to be, 
but I loved being close to the birds. Then one day I fell. I'm sort of famous for that part. Folks call it the Great Fall, which sounds a little grand. It was just an accident, but it changed my life. Fortunately, all the king's men managed to put me back together again. Well, most of me. There were some parts that couldn't be healed with bandages and glue. After that day, I became afraid of heights. I was so scared that it kept me from enjoying some of my favorite things. I walked past the wall every day and I would think about climbing that ladder again. I really miss the birds and being high above the city, but I could never do it because I knew that accidents can happen. I eventually settled for watching the birds from the ground. It wasn't the same, but it was better than nothing. Then one day an idea flew by. Making planes was harder than I thought. It was easy to get cuts and scratches, but day after day, I kept trying and trying. Humpty Dumpty had an idea, and it seems that that idea is related to airplanes. He looks like an engineer here, designing and creating. He kept trying until I got it just right. My plane was perfect and it flew like nothing could stop it. I hadn't felt that happy in a long time. It wasn't the same as being up in the sky with the birds, but it was close enough. He kept trying and trying and finally got it perfect. He was super persistent. He never gave up. Unfortunately, like we know, and Humpty Dumpty knows, accidents happen. They always do. We see the wall, we see the ladder, and I see one of his airplanes flying. I almost walked away again, but then I thought, about all the time I'd spent working on my plane and all the other things I'd missed. So I decided I was going to climb that wall. But the higher I got, the more nervous I felt. I didn't want to admit it. I was terrified. Humpty Dumpty's climbing that wall. That's where his airplane has gone. But we know he is so afraid of heights due to his previous accident. I didn't look up. I didn't look down. I just kept climbing. One step at a time. He just kept climbing. Until I was no longer afraid. Maybe now you won't think of me as that egg who is famous for falling. Hopefully you remember me as the egg who got back and learned how to fly. Life begins when you get back up. The end. At the start of this story, I gave you a couple of questions that I wanted you to listen for the answers of. Let's revisit those questions to help guide us through the remaining parts of our lesson. At the very beginning of the book, we heard this quote. Then one day, an idea flew by. What was the idea? What did Humpty Dumpty design and create? And what problem did Humpty Dumpty try to solve with his idea? Remember, Humpty Dumpty was terrified of heights due to his accident of falling off the wall. 
So he saw those birds fly by and he had the idea to design and create something that we know as a paper airplane, but he designed and created a flying bird to get him as close as possible back up that wall to spend time looking at the birds. And through the process of flying that paper bird, it got stuck on the wall, which required him to face his fears, climb up the ladder, and retrieve it. The last question I want you thinking about, which of Humpty Dumpty's character traits helped him as an engineer and why? Remember, as he was designing and creating that paper airplane or that paper bird, he didn't get it right the first time. He had to try and try and try again. When we don't give up, that's called being persistent. And that's a very important character trait that engineers have. It's something important that we'll need today during our engineering challenge. Engineers need to be persistent because you're not going to get it right the first time. You're going to learn from your mistakes to always make improvements until you do get it right. We know that engineers take real world problems and they brainstorm and think up designs and creations to solve those problems. Humpty Dumpty was an example of an engineer. We also know that when we come up with solutions to problems, we might not always get it right the first time. So we have to try and try and try again. That's called being persistent. Today, we're going to be going through the engineering design process to complete an engineering challenge. So here it is, it's inspired by Humpty Dumpty. We are going to be using found materials around our home to design an egg contraption. The goal is that an egg could get from a height like Humpty Dumpty on top of that wall and he could fall without being harmed. So one more time, our goal for this engineering challenge is to use found materials to design an egg contraption that gets an egg like Humpty Dumpty safely to the ground. I'm going to teach you a little bit about the engineering design process and along the way you'll also see some examples. That's going to set you up for success. At the end of the lesson, when it's time for us to say goodbye, you can complete this design challenge by yourself or with someone at home. Let's take a look at that design process. Now, if you were to jump on Google and research the engineer design process, you would see there are many examples that are all different. But when you dig deep into understanding any of those engineer design processes and you compare them and you contrast them, there are so many similarities. This design process, the one you see in front of you, is the one that we're going to be using today with this engineer design process, we're going to identify a problem. We're going to explore, design, and create. After we have created, we're going to try it out. And most importantly, we're going to take our results and find ways to make them even better. The first thing we need to do when we're going through the engineering design process is identify the problem. So here it is. Using found materials, can you design an egg drop contraption that gets your egg safely to the ground? If you were with me last week, you know humans can greatly impact our earth. And oftentimes, we impact our earth in really negative ways. So the first part of this problem that you see is I want us to use found materials. That's going to require us to reduce reuse, and recycle. I'm going to be asking you to go throughout your home, find trash, possibly clean trash, so you can go through the design and creation process along with me and my guests. We are going to design and create a contraption that's going to lessen the egg's impact, and it's going to prevent the egg from breaking. 
Basically, let's design and create a contraption to ensure this doesn't happen. Our next step is to explore. During this step, we need to do two things. We need to find out what others have done to solve similar problems. And we need to gather our materials and start to play with them and brainstorm with them. So for the exploration, we're going to learn from other people. We could take a look at Google, we could look at YouTube, and we could find other egg drops and make note of what was successful for others and what didn't work for them so we don't make or repeat the same mistakes. During the exploration process, we might also think about what we know about eggs, things like they're fragile, they break. We might think about what we know about gravity. And another important question to ask ourselves would be, what can I do to protect the egg from impact and keep it from breaking? The second part of this process is to gather our materials and start playing with them. On your screen, you can see the materials I gathered from around my home. I purchased nothing. I felt like any of these materials would be helpful in building something that would help me to drop an egg and prevent it from the impact that the ground might have. I think with these materials, I can stop an egg from breaking. This is where the fun begins, the design. You're about to see three different designs from three different people. To begin designing your own egg drop contraption, feel free to use their ideas and make them your own. Remember, more brains are better than one. Up next, create. Let's get to building an egg drop contraption that will save it from breaking. Use your plan to build your idea. You might notice some changes or revisions are being made. That's all part of the process. Feel free to do the same. prototypes that we designed and built. While we test our ideas, we want to make sure we're making observations so we're able to determine what worked and what didn't. That way we can cycle back through the design process and improve our contraption to make it better.
we've done a ton in the last 20 minutes. We've learned about what it means to be an engineer. We know engineers are people who look at the real world, they're looking for problems in the real world, and they're wanting to design and create solutions to those problems. We also know that engineers need to be willing to try things over and over and over again. They need to be persistent. Because the fact is, is most often when we're trying to find a solution to a problem, we're not going to find a solution the first time. Then you helped me and some of my guests as we worked through the engineering design process. We were given the problem of the egg drop challenge and we explored, we designed, we created, and we tried our possible, our potential solutions out. Now, out of the three of us, only one egg drop contraption was successful. Only one was dropped from a height, landed on the ground, and the egg survived the fall. I want you to think back to those results. What worked? What didn't work? What would you do differently? And now what I would like is for you to take the strengths and think about the weaknesses to be persistent, just like Humpty Dumpty. And I want you to try this egg drop challenge again. Make it your own. Cycle back through the engineering design process and give it a try on your own. Good luck with the engineering design challenge. Thank you for joining me today. Stay healthy and I hope you enjoy your summer. Science Study Hall with me, Mrs. Berardi from Osborne Middle School. Um, today we are going to be talking about engineering. And engineering is basically um, imagining, designing, and building things that solve problems and make our lives better okay, and more enjoyable. And today we are going to be engineers. And going along with our definition for engineering, engineers um, develop important and creative solutions to solve problems. So whether that could be something like an artificial heart or technology to clean up an oil spill or even um, rides at amusement parks, we need engineers to make sure that those rides are both fun and safe. Um, so again, engineers just use their knowledge of math and science to help them solve problems. And we are going to be engineers today solving a problem. And we're going to use something that engineers use when solving problems, which is called the engineering design process. So you can see that the engineering design process starts with identifying a problem. Okay, you brainstorm solutions to the problems, think of answers to that problem. Um, you choose one of your brainstorm designs, you build it, you test it, and you see how it does. And if it does well, great, you build upon that. If it doesn't do as well as you wanted, you go back to the drawing board and you try again, or you adjust your design as needed. Okay, so that's why this part over here is kind of a circle. Right, because you have to rebuild it, test it again, maybe rebuild it again, test it again. Okay, but first we identify the problem. And so I always like to use real world scenarios in our engineering design challenges. So um, our real world scenario is that there are a group of scientists in the jungle of South America and they're studying animals down there. And those these scientists, they need supplies, but there's no way that a helicopter or an airplane can land in the dense jungle. So we are going to need to design a device that will allow us to drop supplies to them from an airplane or a helicopter. And our device is going to need to slow the supplies down before they land so they don't break open on impact and get damaged. And they're also, um, our device is going to have to allow the um, materials to be dropped straight down um, so that they can land in a designated area so that the scientists can find the supplies. Here are my scientists and the animals that they're studying. And you can see that big white X on the ground. That's gonna be where we want our um, device to land because that's where the scientists are going to be looking for their supplies. 
Um, when you're testing this at home, you obviously don't need to set this whole thing up. I just did because I had the stuff and I thought it was cute. All right, so um, when we're designing our falling device, you're gonna need the following supplies. So we're gonna be making our falling devices out of some kind of paper. It could be cardstock, it could be construction paper, it could be lined paper, it could just be plain white paper, it could be newspaper, a magazine, whatever paper you have around, use it, that's fine. You're gonna want several pages in case one you mess up, when you two when you have to redesign. Um, you might want a piece of paper to write your ideas down on. You might also want a pen um, for that. Beyond paper, you're going to need tape or glue. You're gonna need scissors. You could rip or tear your paper as needed, um, but it's probably going to be better to use scissors if you have them. Um, and optionally, you can use pretty much any other supplies that you have on hand. So if you wanna use string in your design, if you wanna use rubber bands or paper clips or, or chewing gum, like whatever you have at hand, go ahead and use it. You're not gonna be restricted in this. Um, but it does need to be made at least of paper somewhere in there. <laughs> and we'll talk about what our other criteria are as well. Okay, so our problem more specifically is that you are going to design a device made out of paper and whatever other materials that will stay in the air for at least two seconds when dropped from above your head and it's going to land on or near your target most of the time so i would put your target on the floor you can use tape or just a shoe or whatever something to mark on the floor that that's your target and you're going to drop your device from above your head and needs to stay in the air for two seconds and it needs to land near that target most of the time okay okay so we've identified the problem now we're moving on to brainstorming solutions then we're going to choose one of our designs build it and test it so we're brainstorming next okay so we have um three minutes or you will have three minutes to draw or describe your idea for falling devices on a piece of paper so you could draw several different designs um or you could describe what you you would do in words however you want to do it but you have three minutes to come up with as many ideas as you can and i do challenge you to come up with more than one idea because that way if that one idea doesn't work you have something else that you could try let's see if this timer works here for three minutes Nope, gotta go back, try it again. Come on, timer. Hello. Is it gonna work? Yes, okay. <laughs> and you have three minutes to make your design. Remember, you want your design to be able to float and you want your design to be able to fall accurately. Think about things in real life that help things fall slowly. Draw your ideas. And remember that you're going to only be using paper and whatever you have around the house. So be a little bit realistic with the ideas that you're coming up with. About a minute and a half left. Nice. 
I actually am going to cut this off a little early. So you have about 30 seconds left. Not the minute that it says because of those technical difficulties. I'm going to cut it off a little early. All right, and so I'm stopping that a little bit early because we are going to run out of time if I don't. So here, let's move forward. So hopefully you came up with at least two different ideas. I do not expect you to have built your ideas. I sh I'm showing you right now some of the ideas that I came up with, and I built them before I made this video because I didn't want to have to show you my crummy drawings. Um, so I just built my ideas to show you. But you should have some drawings or some ideas written down on paper that, like, that hopefully you can take one of those ideas and build it. Um, so you might have come up with some stuff similar to mine. You may have come up with something completely different. You can choose one of the ideas that I came up with if you don't like yours. Um, any of these designs would be fine. But if you came up with one that you like, go ahead and build it. And we're going to, I am cho choosing this simple design here to build for myself. And I'm going at this little, it's kind of like a, my plan is to kind of spin it like a helicopter. Um, and see if that will uh, stay in the air for uh, two seconds and land accurately. All right, so um, we're going to take a few minutes to build our first design. Let's go.
Here's my marker that I'm gonna try to uh, hit with my falling device. And I'm going to also time how long it takes. So ready, set, go. Okay, got pretty close. And the time was 0.84 seconds. That is not nearly long enough. <laughs> All right, so we might need to fix that. All right, go ahead. Ready, set, go. All right, it's still pretty close to the target. This time it was 1.14 seconds. My assistant over here is helping me. All right, and last time we're gonna drop it again from above our heads. Time how long it takes and see how close it gets. Ready, set, go. All right, still pretty close. And 1.2, so it looks like it's pretty accurate, it gets pretty close to the mark, but it doesn't quite stay in the air long enough. Remember, it needs to stay two seconds. So I am going to try to think about what can I improve about my design to make it stay in the air longer. Okay, so in um, my first test of my first design, um, I discovered that it was pretty accurate. It fell near the target most of the time, but um, it was not staying in the air long enough. So um, we tested our design here. Now it's time to optimize our design. So tweak it, uh, change it, figure out what can I do or what can you do to your design and what can I do to my design in order to make it fit those criteria even better. Okay, what can I do to my design, for example, to make it stay in the air longer? If your design stayed in the air but didn't wasn't accurate, didn't hit the target at all, then you're going to have to think about what can you do to your design to make it more accurate. Um, you don't necessarily want to start over with a brand new design. This is optimizing. This is how can we change the design we already have or already de decided on, how can we change it to make it better? Okay, so we've identified the problem, we brainstormed solutions, we selected our design, we built it, we tested it, and now we're going to fix it and make it better by optimizing it. Then we will test and evaluate it again, okay? So the thing that I've decided to do with mine is I'm going to make the um, wings or flaps a little bit thinner, um, and I'm hoping that if I do that and I kind of spin it when it falls, that it'll keep it in the air longer. So I'll see you after we're done building and testing. my flaps smaller like thinner rather you can be changing your design however you want so these new flaps should be about exactly half the width of the first ones We'll see if that helps it stay in the air longer. I don't know. Everything else to be the same, just the width of the flaps has changed.
Almost done. My music turned off. There it goes. Okay. I have my new device. Hopefully you're done fixing yours. Here I am testing my uh, redesign with smaller wings. I'm going to kind of spin it like a helicopter. That was my original plan. So here, let, we'll try that. Ready, set, go. Okay, I think it lasted longer. Ooh, two, 27, so over two seconds, perfect, and it's still really accurate. All right, I'm feeling good about this. Ready, set, go. Oh, that one was really not accurate at all, <laughs> and it was not quite two seconds. So maybe not super reliable, we'll try it again. One more time. Remember, we're dropping it from above our head. Ready, set, go. Hey, pretty good. 1.28, hmm. Well, um, the first time it was over two seconds and it's definitely super accurate. There are a couple other things I could try, but we're almost out of time. So um, maybe I'll try a few more things on my own um, and you can try some more things on your own at home as well. All right, so you saw that I tested my second design. It was a little better than the first. Um, I have some ideas of what I could do to make it even better um, and re-optimize. So now we're kind of going to be stuck in this circle of let's build it, fix it, test it again, see what happens, try something else, like tweak it a little bit, build it, test it. Right, so um, and we wanna make it as good as possible. Unfortunately, today we're out of time um, together, but I think I'm gonna continue working on mine here at home and see if I can make it as make it as good as possible. And I encourage you to do the same. Um, see how long you can keep it in the air. See how accurate can you make it. Um, and good luck. Have a wonderful Thursday. been watching Phoenix TV's Study Hall, brought to you by District 8 and our partners at Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts. Tune in Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. for more Study Hall. I hope you learned something today and keep up the great work.